As children, we're forced into a paradigm of sheer reliance. Our senses made contact with an eerie world of things and creatures. Since it's so foreign to us, and since our powers are limited, dependence is the only option that can assure survival. This early phase is characterized cushy and pleasurable. If ever we need a thing, we only have to scream, self-harm, and abracadabra, parents at your service. Then, one day, we suddenly stray into the valley of giants, the adult world. Now, how are we supposed to think for ourselves after having been accustomed to parents and teachers taking care of us, coaxing us what's right or wrong, what we need and what we needn't, what's possible and what's unthinkable? The self is like a tree, sawn a nothing, grown a something. In most cases, this something is not what we have chosen to be. In fact, it's a bunch of junk, external influences loaded into us at times when we were most susceptible. Even the syllables that shape our language, the words we use to speak, to self-talk, the meanings thereof, all these were devised by others. And that the whole of human character is chiefly based on extrinsic effects plainly explains why we lack self-trust and self-authority. Despite all effort to compensate this lack, for years we've been living on the receiving end to a point that our free will mechanism got hindered and molded. For so long we've been on the effect that to cause something would require tenfold the mental effort. Look closely, no one is blocking you from wrestling your fears, but since you're used to someone else to give you permission, you get petrified, you can't move, you're in your head. Is this the right thing to do? Is it socially acceptable? Will daddy agree on this? You are now at once quote unquote the crippled and the crippler. One unlucky day, however, we find out that those we have long perceived as authorities are mere humans, much like ourselves, and that they themselves are scared shitless of life and death, are anxious, contracted and confined by the grandness and weightiness of the world. The aura of authority our parents radiate is just a facade they have to feign, to make the chaotic external seem as though safe and secure, to conceal the bitter truth that one day we're gonna have to stand tall and face reality head on. Regardless of this revelation, even as adults we keep on self-deceiving that someone else will serve as shield against our fears. We postpone confronting them, deluded that one day or another some sort of a savior is gonna do it for us. We usually turn a blind eye on our weaknesses. Quite often, any personal flaw you spot, you shove it away at the back of your head. It keeps on popping up, however, irritating you in a form of background noise in moments when you most need focus. The majority of psychic illnesses are the product of resisting to look inward, as doing so would reveal one's incompetencies and cause feelings of imperfection, which in turn convey that we have no choice now but to self-develop. Though we're conscious of this, we make no effort to change as change would require us to step into mayhem. Thus, fear of self-discovery goes hand in hand with fear of the external world. We make use of countless amusements so we could rationalize how we have no time for self-actualization. We're busy distracting ourselves, challenging ideas, books that prompt self-doubt. No thanks, we're good. Ego protection above all. We would kill for a effortless, meaningless existence. In primitive times, cavemen were tossed into a harsh environment, one that entails consistent battle for survival against the wrath of nature. At the time, human conflicts were at a minimum. Cave people had to worry less about insults or gossip. There were much greater threats to ponder about, things that would naturally force people into union. In case the tribe is jeopardized, there was no question of introversion or extraversion. Every male available is expected to stand for battle. From here, it is safe to say that such environment demands strength and power from every member. I would further presume that cave people embodied greater courage and mental toughness than modern man, seeing that their everyday reality was based on wrestling with evolutionary pressure, from the risk of getting eaten to starving. Nowadays, we live in a bubble of pleasure. If you happen to grow up shy and naive, it's totally fine. No one will ever shove you in discomfort. Today, you have the choice to face the world or live in a cave, play video games, work at home, and never see sunshine ever again. 
Since we do have this choice, unlike caveman, guess what path the majority is gonna take on? The question that presents itself now, why do most people choose a non-challenging life even though they are aware of their limitless potential? Supreme qualities like boldness are granted only to the phoenix, the person who'd relentlessly throw himself in the cleansing fire of fear-inducing situations. Although we're conscious of these opportunities, we tend to avoid such painful yet crucial events. Abraham Maslow called this phenomena the Jonas Syndrome. These peak moments involve the simultaneous swift pumping of adrenaline, blood, endorphins and sweat, also heightened awareness, pounding heartbeats and a activation and deactivation of certain brain parts. It is simply too much for us to stand. We sense as though we're gonna get decomposed or annihilated by the happening, and so our spontaneous reflex is to resist and avoid such experiences. Quote, we enjoy and even thrill to the godlike possibilities we see in ourselves in such peak moments, and yet we simultaneously shiver with weakness, awe, and fear before these very same possibilities. Man's heroism could be shackled by several causes, one of which is lack of authority over oneself. We spend years exercising the silly art of obedience, following orders, nodding heads, and striving to conform to gain approval and status within the herd. Since early age, we get rewarded for this, and hence self-prided, yet punished if we do otherwise. Because of this submission-based socialization, it became nearly impossible for us to think on our own. If ever we feel uncertain, we're more prone to first question someone else instead of experimenting and making our own conclusions. Your will has been bound to external opinions. This is why when confronted with fear, you can only imagine yourself in battle, but cower, in fact, as to act would require free will. A second shackle for heroism could be the Jonah Syndrome. We thrill to transcend into an ideal self, a powerful persona of impeccable traits. We envision all the opportunities such character could grasp. We dream of taking control of our lives, but at the same time, we're terrified of becoming whom we ought to be, for every triumph needs a sacrifice. The acquisition of courage, for instance, involves going through regular pressure, terror, trauma, humiliation, guilt, and doubt. There's no way around it. But unlike cavemen, we do have that stupid choice. Most people got bought in to the cultural hypnosis of a fear-free reality. Plus, these days you have no risk of getting eaten, which makes it easier to rationalize that life is and should be comfortable. If you happened to be born in primeval times, you'd be constrained to do or die. From here, I'm sure it became self-evident to you that human behavior is governed by two major fears. That is, the fear of life and the fear of death. Both are pretty much the basic root of all kinds of anxiousness. Namely, on one hand, we're so overwhelmed by this extensive life intensity, we feel inferior in the face of creation in its chaotic nature, we shiver confronted with peak experiences. All this shapes the fear of life. On the other side of the coin, we've got the ultimatum that hunts us daily. A somewhat strenuous sensation, a nightmarish thought that one day we are going to die. 